Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. We're really glad to have you with us. It's uh, late August here in Connecticut, and it's a beautiful day. There's no humidity, the sun is out, and, and uh, I mean, it just doesn't get much better than this. And it's been kind of hot this summer. We've had some, some hot spells here in New England, a little unusual for us. But uh, this kind of weather is actually more like mid-September weather, and uh, things, things feel great. But anyways, I uh, wish you were here. <laughs> but uh, we're glad to be with you, though. And uh, I'm, as I noted, C.R. Wiley, the senior pastor of the Presbyterian Church of Manchester, and I've written stuff. Glenn, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a professor of early modern European history at Central Connecticut State University and a senior fellow at the Olson Center for Christian Worldview. And I've written some stuff too. And in fact, um, Canon Press has just published a very popular title called The Vindicii Contra Tyrannus. It was a, it's a political treatise on um, revolution, basically, from France in 1579, right in the middle of my period, and I wrote the intro for it. So it makes a great stocking stuffer. Take a look. And, uh, yeah, it's great. It's great. I, uh, I, I read it. I really enjoyed it. I was, taught, I was out in Moscow last week, and I had a conversation with Doug Wilson, and he, he mentioned that he really thought your, your introduction was great. Thanks. Tom. Tom Price, a systematic theologian, Christian ethicist, uh, teaching both at a variety of institutions, uh, one of which is Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, um, working on a lot of things. Um, I'll be announcing them uh, as they start to fall into fuller shape. So, um, but uh, yes, uh, I, this looks uh, enticing, Glenn, and I think many people in the audience would appreciate putting that in their stocking, at least for the holidays. Um, so I think they can imagine uh, ordering it early um, now that it's out. <laughs> That's right. Well, in fact, uh, yeah, I, I would encourage people to get it because um, we may have opportunity to apply the uh, principles contained in that book sooner than we like to but anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's so anyway true. well so, so today is tom's day and tom has told me the theme of his uh, of, of the of the show and it just so happens in god's providence i wore the correct t-shirt i'm wearing my hp love <laughs> craft historical society t-shirt so tell us tom what are we talking about today okay so but before i do the topic i do have to say this I know that there are a host of threads and questions on Facebook and other uh, messages that I have said that I would get back to, and I will. I've just wrapped up four summer courses, and so my head is kind of, I'm doing the exorcist thing, which we'll be discussing a little later anyway. And so, uh, but I, I do uh, aim to fulfill my obligations and, and uh, get back to people that I did say I would get back to. So thank you for listening and for your patience. Um, so, topic. Uh, I'm picking back up with uh, Thomas Hibbs' book, um, Shows About Nothing. Um, a couple weeks ago, we introduced kind of some of, the, uh, uh, some of the topics from the first kind of part of the book. And these topics had to do with kind of nihilism in film and or just kind of the way in which uh, shows have started to generate especially in American culture, but also worldwide, um, that really ha are, are pretty much pointless and, and aimless. And this kind of differs substantively from maybe previous generations of films and shows and literature, um, but it has been on the, the rapid increase and, and may even kind of define a lot of what, what is kind of behind a lot of the, the film and literature and the arts um, that we experience regularly. And so we looked Tom, at a few. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I jump in here? There's, there's something that I, I don't believe I brought it up last time, but I think it's worth thinking about just in connection with the general theme in the book. Uh -huh. There is an anime studio in Japan called Studio Ghibli. They do amazing work. They're really very, very impressive. A guy named Miyazaki, uh, mm -hmm. it runs it. There's one of the um, anime films that they did um, is called uh, something like My Neighbor Totoro. Mm. And it has no plot. 
it you know you 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 watch the thing and you think where is this thing going and it turns out it doesn't really go anywhere i mean it, it really doesn't have a plot line um it's just basically a story about a bunch of kids and this totoro this thing and you know and so on and one of the things that i read about miyazaki is that that film was designed to be a film for young children because young children don't need a plot they don't look for plots they're quite happy to just sit down and watch what's going on now if that's right when you think about that in connection with totoro that makes sense but if that's right is this trend to films about nothing, does that represent infantilization? Yeah, that, that's a very, that, that's something worth really thinking about as we unpack it. I'll tell you why. Because there is this strange um, fascination also with the flip side of nihilism, not the flip side, but the alternative in, in American film anyway, which is romanticism, which is often the idealization of innocence and childhood. Um, but I've never ever thought about making that connection between something they may share in common, which is this, this aim to, to infant, you know, to, to almost reduce to the kind of what they would see as, a, as the, the, the formless, innocence um now whether a nihilist would see it as innocent um is a, is a question but they would at least see it as very much formless and uh without definition this is this is something definitely to keep in mind because i have never really made that connection but they, actually they, there may be a deeper connection between this kind of 19th century romanticism as the alternative to nihilism and maybe something they both share share in common yeah, there's something you brought to you brought out there, Tom, that interests me, and that's the formless. The idea that that the innocent is formless. And yeah. And there's something Eastern about that. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, the the formless part. Yeah. And, and then somehow kind of syncretized with the Western notion of sort of original innocence or something along that line. Yeah. Uh, or or maybe I'm maybe I'm even doing it less. Uh, than it deserves, or, you know, sort of addressing it more superficially than I should. Maybe, maybe there is a sense in which we kind of think that the formless is unfallen. It, you know, like when you think about when you think about yeah. uh, the myth of the androgyny. Yeah, yeah. The idea is that, is that you know you've got something whole that's been separate. You know taken and separated into two sexes and long each half longs for the other but there was a kind of original state that they long to return to um this is a very unchristian way of thinking or pre-christian yeah. or anti-christian yeah. way of thinking but but you know i'm just making these connections right on this right on the fly right now so yeah, well, well, they're worth it because, I mean, before getting into the kind of the horror side and, and those kind of things, is that it's worth talking about the way in which um, the end of the first chapter of Hip's books really talks about that the alternative to nihilistic films has been sort of the say, you know, the kind of the salvation films, if you will, that some, some kind of innocence or something untouched by the corrupting power of civilization or capitalism or or the Enlightenment, or, or any, of the, any of these ways in which, uh, mor you know, forced morality and calculated rationality um, have impacted things. And so, you know, this is Rousseau, for those who, who kind of, history of ideas kind of stuff that, you know, or, you know, Gauguin, all the, all the different figures that somehow nature, I mean, there was, these people would admit, I think, that there's some kind of form to things, but they would think that the organic form is the only innocent form. Well, um, and, and you have to actually push it back a, a little, a well, century before Rousseau even, uh, to somebody like Locke, whose psychology says that when we are born, we're blank slates, we're tabula rasa which yeah. means that our minds in their original state are formless. Yeah. And form is created 
in our minds by our experiences. We categorize them, we organize them, and so on. And that, in turn, would mean that form is artificial. Yes. It also means that it's solipsistic. Each individual can create their own, own kind of forms. Own kind of form, yes. And so the, these kind of threads definitely permeate the kind of way in which American film kind of creates an ideal out of this. Now, it, the American film, according to Hibbs, uh, the romantic emphasis is much more an emphasis on 19th century kind of romanticism. So I'll deal in another episode on that, because uh, I'm doing some research on romanticism in particular, especially the, you know, the self-assertive, self-expressive, and the way aesthetic and, and all the things I think I, I appreciate, art, beauty, and all of this became, it entered back into the picture um, but but in a very in a way that was very different than the way classic uh, the classic vision in Christianity originally emphasized these things. Um, but but what's going on here tends to be kind of just some kind of phase of innocence. Now he'll give a couple of examples of of films that do this. Um, one would be a kind of childlike innocence, uh, like Forrest Gump, right? with somebody where, where everyone else was impacted by the, the pressures of the modern world and the civilized world and everything else. And he has this kind of naivety that preserves him almost from the corrupting influence of all these things. So he just kind of remains, you know, whatever my mom says, mom says this and life is like this, you know? And, and so, and then you have like a Adam Sandler's character in Mr. Deeds, a, a, a much more simplistic presentation, but he's from a small town. He's a pizza, he owns a pizza business. Everyone in town loves him. He's a family guy. Well, all of a sudden he realizes he inherits from the city, some unknown uncle, this, this fortune. So he goes to retrieve it, I think New York City. And then he sees how basically corrupt everyone is. He falls in love with someone who's corrupt, but then she sees this kind of innocence this kind of suburban innocence, if you will. And that um, is the ideal. So he almost talks like a little boy when he engages the, the, the corrupt culture of wealth and you know, cronyism and everything else. And that's somehow to motivate people to kind of see the innocence and purity of the, you know, the simple um, suburban life that he lived. And, and there is some you know, there is something there. I think a Christian even would hold to very strongly, but it's the way in which that becomes a place of innocence rather than likewise a sphere in which evil can penetrate. Um, and this, what, this is what makes it set up for the easy critique, right? Um, romanticism, if it, if it is held up as an ideal, even if it's the family, for instance, and it's ripped out of its larger theological frame and teleological frame, that means um, the distinct purposes and ends for which things are here, right? Um, those things can be set up as false ideals, which become easy targets for their critique, right? And that's what you start to see with the nihilism and the postmodern critique in film. They start to go after these conventional, romantic, safe spaces, if you will, um, but they're really going after a... a caricature of them rather than something that is the reality of them the way for example christianity would would try to to present them um so that's kind of one thing you have these kind of films that uh that kind of turn to they they sort of see uh, another film you uh probably remember <laughs> was et right mm -hmm. E.T. comes and you have this, you know, this evil, corrupt, scientific culture that would dissect E.T. if it could get its hands on him. And, uh, but E.T. has this glowing heart, right? And, and so this kind of warm, innocent creature in contrast with the corrupting, um, you know, and he's, civilized. And he's, saved, and he's saved by a bunch of boys on their yes. bikes. On their bikes, right. And, and again, I, I think there, there is a valid romantic critique of the Enlightenment in that. Um, that that's the kind of the, 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 the existential aspects of human life that was pushed to the margins in a very um, hard rationalism and scientism. Um, but the flip side is what it creates is a false alternative rather than a holistic one that is able to actually balance the aspects of a, a ordered creation and a moral 
a, a moral order that are for, for, for a deep connectedness of the human with all things, but also recognizes that these things are intelligible, that we do have a culture building task in them. And, and so, so what we're dealing with is somebody asked a question, uh, I think on, on one of our uh, episodes to, to kind of define voluntarism and nominalism again. I think this is, you know, kind of a good place to do it because what these different conflicting pictures demonstrate is what we've been talking about over and over again, that when, the, when Christianity broke from God and all things relative to God, in other words, God as the infinite source and end of all things, transcendent and in need of nothing, yet the gift character of everything, Everything created is gift and has, therefore, an order to it, a created order, a moral order, that is intelligible and is oriented for its flourishing towards the creator. That's the classic vision. When there was a break in that, you had God no longer as the infinite source of everything, but the top figure within a chain of similar things. God is the biggest power around. And power and avoid defying God. God is sheer choice. Because God's choice is bigger than your choice, God has a bigger say. And so we enter the competitive realm of the world of, click, of conflicting um, agents. God's choice or your choice. If God chooses something and you choose something, there's going to be a conflict if they're not the same thing, right? And so this becomes the world that left the Christian picture and entered into the modern picture. Well, one of the things that went out of the door was that there was an intelligible moral order and created order, and that all things have meaning, not only in, in terms of how they function in relationship to each other, but ultimately in terms of what their, their significant purposes is, their purpose is in manifesting the intelligibility and glory of God. Right. And so when that gets ripped out, all of creation now, all of the order is seen as arbitrary and relative. God didn't have to do it. God simply chose to because God chose to for no reason whatsoever, other than just choosing to do it. And so there's no confidence we can have that these things are of any real significance. And so the Enlightenment tries to come in and create a new synthesis to make sense of all of these things that don't make sense. And so you have a rationalist picture that uses human rationality as sort of the unifying picture, or you have experientialism that sees human experience as kind of the, the, that which unifies everything and gives meaning and purpose. But then what you get is a group of people who see through the, you know, the chimera of all of that, and they see that that's just a basic facade that hides the fact that there is no real order to anything other than the ones we give it. And there is no ultimate moral or, or created order. And so that's sort of where nil comes in. Right. So where we are today with Black Lives Matter and essentially postmodern uh, postmodernism post as it expresses itself politically socially is that um, we, we see just everybody kind of at each other's throats. And if yes. there's any kind of narrative or meta narrative, as they love to say, yeah. then it's just a cloak for power. So because yeah. white dudes have run the show for a long time, we uh, obviously have made up a bunch of stuff to, 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 to cover for our, ourselves and to, to preserve our interests. And if those things can be just stripped away, you know, white supremacy, so to speak, all that yeah. kind of stuff, then everybody will be free again uh, to just kind of do what they want to do. Um, and this goes so far, you know, this, we, you know, we've talked about this before. In fact, we talked about it very recently with our show on science and cancel culture. Even things that were considered sacrosanct, things that no one could have imagined uh, being questioned, math, empirical science, all those things are now up for grabs. Yeah. And yeah, it seems like uh, the only way that we're going to be able to get out on the other end of this stuff is just to 
kind of let people have what they really want really hard for a while. And then, <laughs> and then, and then just kind of let the pieces fall, you know, you know, fall where they may and then pick things up. Now that's, that's the cynical uh, side of me. That's mm-hmm. the sort of despairing side of me. Uh, my, my energies. Oh, are, you, you, they, you are nowhere near at this. <laughs> Um, because wh- where that leads, if you go that route, isn't people picking up the pieces. It's totalitarianism. Yeah, right. Because right. somebody has to impose order, and you end up right. getting into a totalitarian system. Well, th- and this is this is very interesting because what what you see, and you're going to see this in the films as we kind of move into them, is really the the conflict. And I, I noted this to one of my classes recently. The co- the conflict we often think is, and, and that we as Christians, we kind of feel a little weird in this whole conflict anyway, because there are aspects of all the different sides that we all share. We all work for justice. We all are concerned about all humanity, all races being treated with the full dignity of being made in the image of God. We're the ones who have always been talking about the way in which the purifications of our loves happen. This should take root more than just in our lives, but in our families and the institutions. We're, We're the ones emphasizing this stuff. And, and, and in the gospel, and then we're also talking about the created and moral order, and that this is intelligible, that we have value for the rational, we have value for the whole whole picture. Um, so, so for us, the strange polarity between modernity and post-modernity, and they're warring with each other, is kind of like a war. We, we kind of, we know we, we're in the battle, but we don't know quite why we're in the battle, because neither side fully represents what we have and we actually have the holistic vision that neither of the, neither of them have and so but one of the things I, I was telling my students recently what we have is kind of a second remember we talked about Kantian man as a sort of a, another kind of fall if you will a, a reiteration of the original sin so once Christianity and its knowledge comes on the scene you have Immanuel Kant wanting to bite the fruit and ground everything you know, knowledge of good and evil and everything within the constitution of the human being. Well, in this way, you almost have another synthesis, right? Like the original Christian synthesis of things. And then you have a new nominalism and voluntarism. And so post-modernity is a sense of wanting to crack open that synthesis. And now what you have is the particulars going mad, the, the, the various tribes, um, perspectives, um, group think, whatever it will. And so, but there is no unifying picture. And you're right, Glenn, this is where the political is, takes, fills that vacuum because it has the, the will, if, if you will, to impose an arbitrary order as an absolute. And you have so many tribes competing and you're in, in a Habesian situation in which you need a Leviathan that in order for anything to go forward, that becomes an alternative if there isn't a genuine other, you know? And so, um, and so but, but this is one of the things, you know, we typically are seeing almost in every issue that comes up. Yeah, so what, what, I find what, what, what I find interesting about this is I've always approached nominalism as somebody who studied medieval history. Yeah. I've always approached nominalism through the question of reversals. Yes. I find it interesting that you associate it first with a theological issue, which is that God is just the biggest thing in the created order or in the existing order. Yeah. Now, the thing that's interesting about that to me is that sounds like Plato. Yes. You've got a hierarchy of being with God at the top of it as the source of everything else. It's it's very platonic. Yet yep. nothing else in the system looks platonic. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the thing that I find really fascinating about that particular approach to nominalism. And oh, by the way, thank you for referring to it as a new nominalism because I really <laughs> doubt its continuities with Occam, but that's another, that's a whole yeah. different subject. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. And, and I just mean it more as types in this sense than, than or, 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 or kind of, you know, heuristic ways of interpreting mm-hmm. things. I mean, this you see, you know, uh, Louis Dupree, for example, talks about the Enlightenment as a new set of syntheses, right? Mm-hmm. The attempt to, to to reconnect those things broken with nominalism, 
And what you see is this rebellion, but it's a power rebellion because power, voluntarism, God is sheer power. We are basically power. History is a power. Evolution is the power of nature unfolding itself towards consciousness. And so, so what you have is this new, this, this kind of fight developing between those, those marginalized powers and those centralizing powers. And so this is where you, you have post-modernity coming back towards meta-narratives, if you will, um, with a rebellion, because it doesn't like these kind of what it considers impositions of a narrative without which they don't have a say in the strongest sense of the word. Um, you don't get to define me, you know, you defining me is an imposition of an arbitrary absolute but I get to have a say in it and it's okay for me because I've been kind of pushed to the margins. So therefore it's okay for me to have this arbitrary absolute force, everyone to reckon with. So it's a weird. Because you see, you, you lack access to power. Yes. That's why you can impose this on everybody. Think about that. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's kind of, that's what you have going on here. So with the, in the film situation, I mean, one of the things uh, Michael Gillespie and uh, Chris, maybe this pulls, pulls in some of the horror genre. Um, and I'm going to take it in a different way with the Hib, uh, Hibs book. But, but um, one of the things Michael Gillespie emphasizes is that when you had, you have the horror genre in literature, for example, I mean, think of Frankenstein, for example, you have this start to develop when you have this voluntaristic conception of God or, or, or the human enter the picture. Because what you have is sheer will and want ungoverned by any intelligence or anything else, but just the sheer power of will. And so you don't know what Frankenstein's going to do, right? Because Frankenstein is not governed by any kind of intelligible moral order but is free from that beyond good and evil if you will and therefore is a frightening figure i mean this is why descartes needs to tame this god with rationality through through the human being but the horror genre according to michael gillespie develops because that omnipotence that once was ascribed to the voluntaristic god now gets ascribed to human figures or some kind of supra-human figure like Frankenstein. Yeah, that's fascinating stuff to consider. And my mind goes in different directions. One of the directions is that one of the ways that you can make sure that you don't get beat up in a tough neighborhood is act crazy. Because <laughs> even, even like really tough guys are kind of freaked out by the crazy dude. Yeah. Because you just don't know what this what guy is going to do. do. Yeah. That's right. You know, it's just like, so there's a, you know, even even a thug needs rationality in order to be secure in his thuggery. <laughs> that, that, but, that kind of, yeah, that, that, that reminds me in e Eastern <laughs> Orthodoxy, you have the holy fool, right? Um, right. Everyone's af afraid of the irrational figure, but maybe there's some wisdom in that. In that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the other thing uh, has to do with the nature of horror, I guess, you know, is it, is is modern horror something that we can distinguish from say pre-modern horror like like if you if you look at said Hiram Bosch and his uh yeah. you know his his paintings the trip, where yeah, we have the these, yeah we have all of this uh, uh really uh crazy stuff going on yeah and, and frightening right. stuff and monstrous stuff and, you know, but that was kind of within a framework that was uh, pretty, I, I, I guess, um, rational insofar as it was the damned that were depicted in this manner, if I'm, if I'm interpreting him correctly. Yeah, I unless, think you're unless right. He's, unless he's drawing from, from something uh, pre-modern or pagan. And you're talking about the, the, the kind of the triptych that has like the garden of earthly delights and then, you know, and, and then the people living in this sort of pleasure end up in this hellish. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if that is what I'm thinking about. I, I, I just have these, these images uh, in my mind of just, you know, I can't remember when he painted. Do you, do you remember, do you remember, Glenn, when, when he century. was? 16th yeah. century. 
Okay, so not as far back as I had assumed, but still enough of the medieval kind of, you know, still present. Well, there, there, there's a vocabulary in the painting. Mm -hmm. He's drawing from a, a, a boatload of what were in that period kind of stock images. He's just kind of putting them together, concentrating them, exaggerating them. But there, there are a lot of things that he's doing within the Garden of Earthly Delights where he's yeah. picking up on images that would have been more or less in his own day. So, for example, there's one guy who is eating a giant strawberry, and the, the strawberry is, is bigger than he is. <laughs> and, and the thing about strawberries is that they were used as a symbol for lust because the oh. strawberry tastes really, really good but there's no aftertaste. It doesn't last. Oh, huh. interesting. So, so that was used as a symbol for lust. There are all kinds of things like that incorporated into the painting, along with some stuff that makes me wonder what kind of mushrooms he had with dinner. But, <laughs> you know, that, that's, but that's the stuff I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. that's the stuff I'm getting at. And it, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's, yes. <laughs> and even the, the faces, idea, yeah. Yeah, but the idea of horror, so like when we think about, say, you know, someone that I know a little bit about, H.P. Lovecraft, he's, uh, he's working within a, a sort of cosmology that would be familiar to, uh, you know, Blaise Pascal or other modern thinkers, you know, who uh, would have rejected Lovecraft's atheism, but shared Lovecraft's sort of horror at the vast, empty spaces, yeah. you know, you know, what we, what we have in modern cosmology is something that uh, is horrific in, in the sense that it's so outsized and, and indifferent. You know, what you had in, say, say, medieval cosmology was terrifying things which were terrifying because they were intent on getting you. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, but yeah. what you have in modern horror with like a love, a Lovecraft is the indifference of something monstrous that can just squash you like a bug and not even know. Yeah, yeah and that, I think that's what Gillespie is kind of onto is that that kind of th that the latter. Um, but it, but it is it is interesting to to kind of see it now. Now what Hibbs kind of moves into is the way in which in the American context, the contemporary horror film kind of mercifully, uh, you know, mercilessly, um, if you will, sorry, um, tries to, you know, the way he puts his unveil the bankruptcy of the contemporary psychology, sociology, and law as the Enlightenment has. Them. So there is a critique in his interpretation of the kind of American um, horror film. And he calls it the aesthetics of evil, <laughs> which is interesting in itself. And he says that in which in some of these, horror films they try to shift the, the allegiance so that the viewer actually shifts um from the victim to actually having um a sort of sympathy with the devil if you will mm -hmm. um and 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 he says um, one of the things that um these films try to do is kind of play on moral ambiguity um and he thinks off the times of dark comedy but he says one of the things at the heart of it is kind of a critique of conventional society um, but he, he kind of makes a clear distinction, and I, I see Gillespie shows up in his footnotes a lot, between conventional society and Christianity. He wants to make a little bit of a di distinction that a lot of what is being critiqued here is actually the kind of traditional values that Enlightenment took from Christianity, but ripped them from their meaning context and made them an odd feature of the Enlightenment, which made them an easy target. That's what he's kind of on to. And so when you get to, when he moves to the next genre of a film like Miss Ro Mrs. Robinson, right? You're going to see the absurdity of kind of family life and, 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 and the kind of cultural values because people are starting to see through the thin veil of the way that classic Christian ethics sitting in this framework of the Enlightenment don't deliver. And so the horror genre and some of these critical genres are after that kind of, they're criticizing that kind of um, arbitrary adoption by the enlightenment of the Christian heritage, if you will. And, he, and one of the notes that he puts in there is he said a lot of times Christian 
people become reactive to that, but he says, actually, there's something insightful there. Is this is what happens to your ethics when they're ripped from the Christian theological vision and put in a vision that actually undermines them. And I think this is what we've been saying oftentimes of evangelicalism as a whole, is it, its, whole, its whole system of, its whole understanding of salvation and the moral order and created order, when it is placed within the framework of the Enlightenment or, or, or other things, actually doesn't fit <laughs> and becomes an easy target because it's not grounded in those things that it actually should be grounded in. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and along with that, one of the great failures that we have in educating the next generation is that we tend to view the ethical and moral dimensions of Christianity through a nominalist lens. It's an yes. art the exercise of power rather than something that makes coherent sense because it is an outworking of the fabric of the world. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and this, I think, is, you know, the thing of, of doing a, a kind of meditation on this theme allows us to actually see the way in which the debate and the critique are aimed at things which we actually have a lot to say about without really being caught up in, in the critique so much. And um, now three of the films um, he talks about that are really um, representative of this kind of aesthetic of, of evil. Um, and, and one of the other uh, points, let me put this out there first, was that there is in these films a sort of confidence within the demonic characters. And they're sort of celebrated for their um, creative transcendence of the categories of good and evil. Um, and what they mean by that is the categories of good and evil as the Enlightenment has defined them. And so, but one of them, of course, was the Exodus, uh, the Exorcist, sorry, 1973. Um, and then you had uh, Cape Fear. I think you remember that one, Silence of the Lambs. These, these are certain um, movies in which the allegiance has kind of shifted to where the, the evil villain hero remains the center character. And that perspective and critique becomes what is focused on in the film. Um, so, they, so maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it might be good to just quickly uh, summarize those three films. Uh, Exorcist, of course, mm -hmm. is about an exorcism, about mm -hmm. a, uh, if I recall correctly, a girl who's been possessed. So I'm, I'm assuming that we're referring in this case to either her or actually the de demonic presence. Uh, as being sort of the hero anti-hero. Yeah, in the way in which almost, I mean, in, in, you know, interesting, he says a bit later, he gets to the, he, he kind of, ex, you know, exposits the film a little bit later. Um, but one of the things he mentions in that film is, yes, you have on the one hand, you have, you have a lot of themes going on, the kind of medieval supernatural worldview, the enlightenment worldview, and then, and then sort of this kind of, this critique of, of all this stuff. But yeah, there, yeah, you have this kind of supra, you know, something unexplained by the Enlightenment and something not able to be dealt with by the medieval worldview. And so right. what you do is you have this kind of unleashed something. Um, and, and I think this is even where he gets in some of these um, films, even the, the contemporary uh, appeal to the psychological can't, can't contain this. Right. Well, let, let me just jump to the other two here quick so we can summarize those. Now, I'm familiar with Silence of the Lambs. I, it's Hannibal Lecter, correct? Yes. You know, yeah. sort of the, the, the a serial killer cannibal type character. I mean, you can't think of a more despicable character just conceptually than that. But I, I get your point about him being kind of the, the really the interesting character and yeah. even in some weird sense, the sympathetic character. Now, and, the he out, and he outwits the, the kind of conventional. I mean, and you know, whether it's law, whether it's psychology. Right. Yeah. Right. And so then, then you have Cape Fear. Uh, I, don't, I don't know anything about that one. But, but getting back to the, just quickly before you summarize that one, I think of the psychological thriller, I think of someone like Alfred Hitchcock, you know, yeah. when I think about like Psycho or something like that. So yeah. I, I agree, you know, there's something, there's something unsatisfying to the sort of the psychological take on evil that we see in Hitchcock. 
But what what is Cape Fear about? I can't remember uh, ever seeing it seeing it or having it summarized. And uh, it's been a while, but what I remember I, the, the the version I saw of it was with Robert De Niro, mm -hmm. and he he ends up being this kind of yeah this evil figure that it almost is uh, it's it, he's 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 kind of like an evil Pentecostal, if you will. He's got all these signs on tattoos of himself as like born again. He speaks in tongues, but he uses all this charismatic, uncontrolled lingo to put fear into a, a family that is out on a boat in the middle of nowhere. And, and he's, I think, I, if I remember right, he's sort of targeting the daughter, but he's terrorizing the family. And so, but this is, this is, you know, I don't remember the details of the story. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but it's another one in which you have this kind of, yeah, he becomes a central figure. His uncontrolledness exposes the, the frailty of the enlightenment resist, you know, things that are meant to buffer and resist. And therefore he becomes interesting and a critique of all that because he exposes exactly how vulnerable it is. I mean, it, you know, maybe you could say it's what we're seeing um, in, in kind of, uh, you know, post-Enlightenment cities where their radical offspring have exposed just how vulnerable um, those systems are um, because of... Well, yeah. yeah. You're making me think of the whole white fragility thing. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Well, but... Uh, it, to, to go in a bit of a different direction, um, Roberto Rivera, years ago, he works over Breakpoint, years ago he did a, a workshop I saw on horror, and he used actually Buffy the Vampire Slayer as an example. And one of the things that he pointed out is when you're going past the Hannibal Lecter's and the Cape Fear into the things that most people would identify first and foremost as horror rather than thrillers, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, you know, those kinds of things. He says it is almost always a sexual transgression that unleashes the evil. Hmm. And he saw in that a sort of, um, if I'm remembering him correctly, he saw in that a kind of uh, ambiguous reaction to the sexual revolution. Like, was this really a good idea or have we you know, have we actually unleashed a monster here? Right. Uh, yeah. And the other thing though that, that I would note is that in almost all of these cases, evil is almost omnipotent. Yeah. So you you know you you can't kill you, you, you can't kill Jason. You can't kill any of the, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big aficionado of horror movies, but I know that, you know, there are situations where there is literally nothing you can do to stop the evil. Well, this is, this is similar to Michael Gillespie's point is the omnipotent God gets, becomes embodied in these figures. Mm -hmm. And so this voluntaristic God of sheer power and will, can't be stopped, gets embodied, basically. Now, yeah, there are some films that kind of muster up something to try to be that which overcomes it. Um, but in, in some sense, you're, you're almost left powerless. Uh, Chris, you had a different point. I'm going to return to Glenn's. Uh, you wanted to mention it before it kind of got lost in the wind there? Oh, I, I, I lost it. It's okay. Not important. Okay. Well, oh, yeah, I'm, radi I, I'm radioactive. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was on white for Jilly. Well, I'll, I'll, let's get, we'll get back oh, to yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, now, now that you mentioned that, <laughs> it brought <laughs> back to my, to, to, to my, my trip to, to Portland. I was out in the West Coast last week, and I uh, had the privilege of speaking in Vancouver, Washington, which is right across the street, or right across the river, I should say, from, from Portland. And one of the elders of the church that I was speaking at uh, took me into Portland, and as we're driving into the city, I see all these tents everywhere, you know, sort of in the, you know, you know, next to the highway, in the, on the median, all these, you know, places where, it, you know, it's not private property, but it's, it's not, it's like unused, you know, sort of public space. And I, I say, are these the protesters? And he says, well, yes and no. I mean, they're here all the time. They've been here for years. In other words, there was this sort of vagrant uh, community uh, taking up space. <laughs> there all the time and when you walk around downtown and 
Portland, if I, I, I've been told, is the whitest city in America. So it's really quite <laughs> paradoxical that it, this should be the center, of, you know, of Black Lives Matter matters protest and stuff. But anyway, in, in fact, I think I maybe saw like five black people my entire yeah. time in the city downtown. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but the, what, I, what I'm looking at are, uh, you know, you know what I'm going to, you know what I'm, what I'm saying when I say this. What I'm looking at are uh, graduates of, um, you know, the the uh, the art program at, uh, you know, Central Connecticut State University or at uh, yeah. St. Joseph's. You know, what we're talking about are, are people who whose ideals make them unfit for modern life in some in some respect, uh, and consequently have no place to fit. And in their rage, they are tearing down the everything. I mean, it's just like the, um, and 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 their elders are have indulged them their entire lives and still can't discipline them when they're throwing uh, Molotov cocktails at the federal building. I mean, it's just that kind. Of, it's that just that kind of thing. It's it, it and it's interesting because that that characterizes one of the um, one of the films that that he he engages um, from I think seventies I, I believe it was Deliverance where he was talking. Do you, do you remember that film? Um, oh sure, Deliverance. Yeah, with the hillbillies and everything. The hillbillies yeah, Bert, and Burt Reynolds. Yeah, yeah. Burt Reynolds. That's going to one up it, and then the other one is um, the gate uh, the getaway. You remember the getaway? I don't know that. I don't with Steve McQueen and, and Ali McGraw, they basically are, they go on this kind of extended, it's kind of a love story, but crime film. And they basically are celebrating the criminal, the violent criminal, you know, and how they get away and they, they outwit the law in the society. Yeah, Bonnie, they, they, Bonnie and Clyde, yeah. Bonnie and Clyde. And, and, and so Doc and Carol are the characters. But anyway, at the, at, at the end, um, once they, they finally get away, you know, and the whole story is kind of, are they going to get away with it and be freed from prosecution and getting caught? Well, in, in, uh, there's, there's kind of a tension that, that Hibbs notes that, uh, between the way the American film ends and the actual story goes. But it, on, on the hand, it's, it's telling in both cases. Um, but in, in, the, in the film version, it kind of, he calls it, ends up with a kind of comic nihilism um where they they end up getting away successfully and they but they don't live happily ever after they they know that their two personalities are such that they're going to conflict with the same conflict they put on everyone else with each other um but but the the interesting thing is the way the actual story that it was written on and i believe it was let me see if i got my have, have this uh, right um Jim Thompson, I, I think he was the writer of the actual story. I'll have to confirm that. Well, anyway, the, the way the actual story is, is they actually get away into Mexico and they have to go, in order to, to be free, they have to go to basically this socialist uh, commune in which they have to go into hiding. But it is filled with all of the problems and issues that socialism actually has. And so for their, all of their attempts to, to, to free the Enlightenment capitalist world and all of its triviality, they, their freedom takes the form of a new enslavement. <laughs> and it is very telling because of kind of where, you know, the, these things end up. But he, it's one of the things that he says at the end is all they had teleologically was a negative vision to get away from this, to get away from this, to get away with this. But on the positive vision... They had nothing. There was no, no, no ultimate purpose and fulfillment. And then he says, here's the film, uh, and this is what kind of worth engaging a little bit more, is um, you remember the, the kind of uh, coming-of-age film, if you will, during that period was uh, Mrs. Robinson. Um, oh, yeah, right. Graduate. Right, graduate. And mm -hmm. so one of the things he talks about is kind of how this nihilism creeps in to the figure of the story. So Benjamin, played by Dustin Hoffman, um, he basically, um, at the beginning, you have him having a party, right? Uh, a family celebrating right. his, his graduation. Right. And so all the party goers are in there celebrating the fact that he was head of the cross country team, head of the debating club, um, all these values of kind of the, the, the culture around him, right? The things you should, you'd hold, he was, um, the editor, associate editor of the college newspaper, he managing editor his senior year. 
Um, but he goes to his bedroom and he's basically feeling nauseous because all of this, that, that this plastic, gen these people put on his generation felt plastic to him and no meaning, right? All of these so-called part of the moral fabric of a society had no meaning whatsoever. So there's and your- what, mm -hmm. And what's the advice that's given to him? One word. Plastics. Plastics. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's so right. It, I mean, it's it, 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 exactly- yeah, to invest. It's, it's, it's like yeah. investment advice, right? Yeah. Right. If you want to, where you want to put your money is plastics. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so he has this, uh, this, this conversation with his father and he goes, and he's trying to talk to his dad. He's just like, I'm just, and his father's like, what, worried? And he's like, well, about what? And he goes, well, I guess my future. And he goes, what about it? Because basically he had his future paved by, by the telos of the society, right? He goes, I don't know. He goes, you want to be what? And he goes, different, which meant that somehow he, his existential experience was, of course, wider than the, the kind of the thin cultural experience. But they, they keep pressing what is that that is there, because for a lot of people, you know, that was kind of the way life took shape and you just rolled with it. Um, but but there is some there's some kind of void here, and th this I think is where you do see the you know the creative aspect touching and pressing into the Enlightenment vision, the way America kind of framed it. That there were things there were things from the Judeo Christian heritage that had all of the substance and allowed it to do what it do, but because it ripped it from its original telos and ontology and placed it within the Enlightenment one, which couldn't ground it, this figures actually onto something. And so their criticism isn't against, you know, maybe they would be against anything that placed norms over them, but on the whole, they're critiquing the plasticity of the arbitrariness of a nominalist conception of these conventions. And so now what they realize is that they don't satisfy. So he ends up what uh, being able easily being able to be manipulated by the wife of well Mrs. Robinson right Mrs. Robinson right well do you, you remember that song Mrs. Robinson yeah which I yeah. think was uh, uh, Simon Garfunkel. Garfunkel is that right yeah yeah, yeah. Simon Garfunkel. so remember, remember the line about Joe DiMaggio mm -hmm. um, DiMaggio didn't understand the song and he was going to sue I don't know if you remember that <laughs> but I didn't uh, DiMaggio. That. Yeah, DiMaggio was a fairly, um, well, from the things I've read, he was a pretty self-centered guy, and if uh, somebody didn't pay him what he thought he was due, he was upset about it. But there was something that he missed, obviously, which was what they were saying is was the highest praise imaginable. Where had he gone Joe DiMaggio? <laughs> In other words, there was a heroism yeah. that uh, DiMaggio embodied that no that that uh, you know you can't believe in it anymore where have you gone joe dimaggio where have the heroes gone in other words mm -hmm. so there's a you know when we get back to the judeo-christian vision or to the classical vision mm -hmm. uh the heroic is a is a way of uh pursuing the good that uh you know s only certain people mm -hmm. were capable of embodying or you know expressing so like what this does for me is is as the conversation is sort of unfolded i've thought about well all those ridiculous people in their tents in in portland <laughs> it seems to me that you know in an earlier time maybe they were martyrs maybe in an earlier time they were nuns maybe in yeah, an earlier yeah. time they were soldiers in other words the 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 kind of the the aspirations that don't find any sort of constructive output or expression yeah. uh, are, are just simply directed against the machine. And there's a kind of, you know, pitiful, you know, it's really kind of pitiful when you think about it. They're giving themselves over to something that they don't understand, which doesn't work out in anything positive, uh, makes things worse, but they're, they don't really think that they have any alternative. And, and does the contemporary church, does the contemporary church that looks more like an entertainment center or your living room with its, you know, sort of plastic 
sayings. You know, yeah. we, I, I saw something here the other day. Mm -hmm. Max Licato mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Phil Vischer, the guy who was behind VeggieTales, you know, they're, they're now on the, you know, uh, Black Lives Matters bandwagon. You know, they're, they're all about social justice now. Now, what, what makes that just so, so remarkably uh, absurd to me is that I always thought of them as absurd to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, was, there, was some, there were things about them that just struck me as shallow, you know, and as uh, not doing justice to the Christian faith. Now, Bob the Tomato, I just think Bob the Tomato is just wonderful. But, yeah. um, but there was also a sense in which um, there was something horribly degrading about Bob the Tomato. <laughs> you know, I'm probably going to put a bunch of hate mail saying Bob the Tomato was great. I'll probably get a well, bunch of tomatoes thrown at me. <laughs> well, yeah, someday I'll tell you what Eric Metaxas said to say about Bob the Tomato, but that, that, that's... Uh, uh, yeah, well, he, well, yeah. But <laughs> actually, the, the, going back to The Graduate for a moment, there's another mm -hmm. thing that he takes on as well, that the film takes on as well. You know, so he has the affair with Mrs. Robinson. It destroys the family. The daughter that he was really in love with is going to marry somebody else. Yes, this is where it goes. The yep. wedding, and they run off together. Yes. And they get on the bus and they're driving away on the bus. They're riding on the bus and they look at each other and you get the distinct impression. They are thinking, what now? Yes, this is exactly even, what he hits on. Even yeah. the romantic... You know, the, the alternative to nihilism, the romanticism, even that gets skewered in the movie. Yes, he, he ends, it's, it's exactly how he ends uh, even the chapter, uh, well, well, his discussion of it. He said there's this vacant look they have um, after they achieve all of this, you know, ripping her from the convention of getting married to someone she doesn't love, following through all of this. And that's when he, he sums it up. You know, of course, they say it, it's actually, in, in a way, is a brilliant aspect going on here. It's a critique. It's a critique also of the romanticism that should was the alternative because Elaine becomes sort of the what he, he thinks he's looking for, right? That's the daughter, and of course she gets upset because of what he does with the mother, and so she goes off and kind of goes back to the conventional, and she's getting married as, as you say. But in that final scene, basically he comes in, grabs her away, they run off, and they get on a bus with a bunch of elderly people of all things, which is interesting. Um, but uh, in that, they get on the bus and they don't, they have a little bit of an elation, but then they look like they're lost. Mm -hmm. And they realize, oh my gosh. And so this is where uh, Hibbs actually says, this is exactly where they have a negative sense. The, the negative is all they have. But once they move to, to, to the positive, there's no hope, there's no purpose, there's no telos to govern the next step. And that look that they have kind mm -hmm. of embodies that. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, to put this in a, in a different frame, uh, and I've been obviously thinking a lot about Lord of the Rings lately because of my Bombadil book, and I'm working my way through, through the book, you know, maybe for the 10th time. <laughs> but, but one of the things that's so delightful about all the characters is this lack or this, uh, the absence of uh, sort of the ironic stance or the, the vacuous or the uh, feudal, I mean, you know, take a character like Sam. Sam is fully in the moment. You know, he, he's, he's, when he's worried about Bill, the, the, you know, the pony, he's fully engaged with the, with the pony. When he's thinking about Fro Frodo, his master, he's fully given himself over to the care of his, his uh, you know, his master. And in each step of the way, there's, you know, it, you know, not just Sam, but all the characters. Maybe, maybe the only characters that are not that way uh, are the elves. But, but in a different sense, they're not. They're obviously, they're not. You know, uh, reprehensible. They're they're praiseworthy. But, but their their stance is is due to their immortality and the fact that all the things that they have given themselves fully to have faded away. And. And then uh, maybe Saruman or Sauron. Maybe it's the only the evil characters that have that kind of that kind of distance. Yeah. Hmm. 
Yeah, Chris, on on the people in the tent cities around yeah. Portland, I think of the 16th century, and where they would have ended up is in Münster, where there was a an explosion of idealistic radicals that resulted in total chaos in the city, uh, or in the Bauern Creek, the uh, the Great Peasants War. Uh, you know, where they were, you know, that that's where they would have ended up in the past. They'd have ended up in some sort of, um, you know, utopian rebellion that would get crushed. Yeah. Now, which brings they to mind the, 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 you know, the the thing that uh, nothing new under the sun is just <laughs> a different sort of way it's expressed. Um, anyway, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> well, we're. We, we should probably start wrapping up. I think we're getting to that point. Is there anything that, that, uh, you know, we should, you know, leave our listeners with, maybe we can leave, you know, the last word to Tom. I don't have anything else to add, but Glenn, do you have anything you wanted to say? Um, yeah, well, let me just, uh, let you know, Eric Metaxas's take on Bob the tomato. Eric was <laughs> yeah. a uh, writer for <laughs> details and he came to speak at uh, first church where I attend church uh, one year before he became um, famous and uh, you know we he we noted that he had, was the only person I knew that had written for both Chuck Colson and Larry the cucumber <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he came in to speak and he was talking about his time at veggie tales and he said you know you all think of Bob the tomato as this jovial Christian guy but I got to tell you, Bob is a bitter chain smoking atheist. We need to pray for him. <laughs> <laughs> so off good. camera, Bob is Bob is a bitter man. A yeah, bitter so I, I really don't think I have anything more to add than that. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I'm going to draw. I'm going to draw Bob now with a <laughs> with a cigarette. <laughs> and, and I'll credit Eric Metaxas. So I'm, I'm, know, a, that, a, Mar I'll, I'm a Marlboro man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think he's Benson Hedges. I, you know, he's, he's something, something, something. I don't know. I'll have to reflect on a little bit. <laughs> That's good. Anything you want to? Say, anyone, anything you want to say, Tom? No, this is always a fun topic, and I think the neat thing about film and, and even a book like this is it allows worldview and. A lot of the issues we're talking about, because you know, come to a place of reflection where you know sometimes we can see this stuff in in action in ways that it's harder to see sometimes with just you know floating the ideas out there. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll revisit some of the other topics you know in other weeks uh, because I think it's a good outlet for tying th the threads we've been talking about week after week into something we can watch, see, digest, and kind of analyze. Sounds great. Well, anyway, just a, just a uh, couple of things quick. We've got some uh, shows in the works that, uh, that we're excited about and we'll let you know about. But something else we're excited about is the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network Conference coming up in October, October 1st through the 3rd in Nashville. And uh, we would really love to see you there. We're going to have a booth. We're going to have some of our pug cast glasses and shirts. And by the way, those are going out soon, I know. So uh, folks who've, uh, been, who've pledged uh, and have uh, supported us, you will soon be rewarded. And uh, we want you to, to, to enjoy those when you get them. But getting back to the conference, it would be awfully nice uh, to see you there. And if you would like to learn more about that, just look up the information on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network website. Anyway, glad to have you with us again for the podcast. Bye-bye. Bye now.